face four o'clock. Can I please ask everyone to move their microphones? Officers and guests, could you also turn off your cameras? You should turn on your camera and microphone when you speak, but please turn them back off again afterwards. All councillors must ensure that their cameras remain on and uh, the recording started. So, Prynhawn Dar, welcome. Good afternoon to the Social Services Scrutiny Committee on Tuesday, the 18th of October. Please note that this meeting has been recorded and may be broadcast by the authorities' internet site. The images and sound recording may also be used for training purposes within the authority. Agenda item one, apologies for absence. Uh, we've had apologies of absence from uh, Officer Lita Curtis-Jones and Cabinet Member Julia Jenkins. Agenda item two, declarations of interest. Uh, declarations of interest, members are reminded of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and prejudicial interest in respect of matters contained in this agenda in accordance with the provisions of the Local Government and Finance Act 1992 relating to council tax, the Local Government Act 2000 and the Council's Constitution and the Members' Code of Conduct. Members are reminded they must identify the item number and subject matter that the interest relates to and signify the nature of the personal interest and where members withdraw from a meeting as a consequence of the disclosure of a prejudicial, I can't say that word, prejudicial interest, they must notify the chair when they leave. Are there any declarations of interest? No. Okay, agenda item three. So this is the cost assessment and underspend in DFG. Uh, so we're going to receive the report on this and Head of Adult Service Angela Ed Vane is going to introduce us and take us through the report. Thank you, Angela. OK, thanks very much. Um, draw your attention to report scrutiny requested that we bring a report to look at how we can add value, <clears throat> how scrutiny can add value to address some of the issues around the community occupational therapy service and the DFGs. The report, although is in my name, has been compiled in with um, considerable support from Suzanne Lewis Abbott as the DFG element of it actually sits within the housing element uh, within the local authority. If you look at the summary of the report, the report outlines the past and current position in respect of people waiting for community occupational therapy assessment and covering the number of people who were waiting previously and the current waiting lists. It includes some of the rationale and the reasons why we <clears throat> seek to undertake more complex DFGs for those people living in the community. It outlines the current financial position um, from the previous years and the current spend for this year. And we would ask through this, the scrutiny um, discuss the content of the report. I would like to draw your attention to um, point three four, which indicates the number of referrals that are received by the community occupational therapy team. Um, it's now averaging 15 to 20 a week, whereas pre-pandemic it was between four to seven per week. So we have seen a considerable increase in the number of referrals that we get in for community uh, OTs. This in part, we're not sure of whether this is partly a holdover from the pandemic or if it is, you know, sort of an increase in demand generally, as we know um, that we have an older population of people living in the Mertha, and we've outlined that in section 3.5. In section 3.8, we've said that if you look at um, the majority of the disab bigger disabled facility grants are in relation to adaptations for um, bathrooms and wet rooms, which seems to be a common theme in some of the bigger areas in terms of um, DFG requests. Section 3.9 highlights how much we actually have on an annual basis in terms of um, funding for DFGs, which is £850,000 capital um, each financial year. We then move on to say that in 3.10, what we've seen over a number of previous years is that there has been an underspend in the DFG budget. Um, some of the rationale for that is is quite complex. Is when we saw that we had a reduction in the community OTs, which meant that the assessments weren't being undertaken. 
We also saw that, you know, the in-house grants team, there were, uh, was a period where, you know, th they were off on long-term sick and in order to look at that and provide more resilience um, is now commissioned through RCT. So it was a number of factors that attributed to the underspend over um, the last three years prior to that. Obviously, then we had a period where we were, you know, sort of um, not assessing as much because of the pandemic. So that had a, um, was a contributory factor, along with the fact that there was no building contractors available. So that led to some of the financial underspend for those years. If you look at section 4.1, you can see that on average where we were is that the urgent waiting lists were actually being dealt with immediately and examples of urgence would be someone um, was providing with care and support who was no longer able to sort of stand or wait bear um, complex cases with children and they were being responded to immediately. You can see then substantial um, was waiting on eight months with the waiting list of 80 people. Um, moderate was on average waiting for 11 months with 60 people on the waiting list. And for the low, we were looking at 14 months average waiting for assessment and 33 people on the waiting list. And if you look at it, the paediatric was much quicker with the longest being five months. But that was, again, these are all triaged whenever they came in. Section 4.2 outlines, you know, some of the staffing issues I've already mentioned earlier. And we can see in 4.3 that highlights the impact that the pandemics had on both the COTS and the grants teams during this period. You can see in section 4.5 that covers off the um, arrangements with RCT to manage the grants element on behalf of um, Mercer Titchfield County Borough Council. Um, and then if you look at it, we are now on where we are now. Now, we can see there when the first comment we made is that, you know, we've had increased stability within our community OT team. We've um, adjusted the compilation and we've changed one of the OT posts into a senior OT post, which has you know, been quite positive in terms of the overall support and clinical supervision for the team. And what we are seeing now, the, the team has been stable for a while. And you can see the impact that has had in terms of the waiting list for um, assessments in the table in 5.2. So the top section is covering off the same data that was in where we were. And then when you look at it lower down, you can see now where that improvement is actually um, taking place. So uh, for an illustrative purpose, Urgent remain the same in as much as there was no waiting list. We can see that for our substantial referrals, the waiting has gone from eight months down to an average of no to four weeks. And it's gone from waiting list of 80 people on that to five people. And that's reflected all the way through. But ultimately, we now see in from a waiting list earlier in the year, last year uh, of 188, we're now down to 61. But bearing in mind that this is not a stagnant cohort of people, they are continually moving in. So every time people are going out, we still get that 15 to 20 in each week. So this is, you know, sort of dealing with those and sort of reducing the waiting list. So for me, I think we've seen a significant improvement in some of the performance within the, the OT team. Um, some of the things that have affected the DFGs, you know, is that Welsh Government last year brought in recommendations that we do not charge for um, lower level adaptations, um, which are the in-between parts rather than the large, which were subject to um, financial assessment as to someone's to determine someone's ability to pay for the you know or contribute towards the adaptation 
We can see then in section 5.5 is looking at, you know, the average spend per year and those are subdivided into large, medium and small DFGs. And you can see there's been, there was showing an increase, but then we can see that it's reduced last year because of um, the COVID um position and as of this year we are still in the process because we get the invoices at the later date so that's why it's limited financial information um for um this year but we do have some subjective you know so sort of indicative costs along with the dfg the current funding cap of a DFG under the legislative guidance is 36,000. That's remained at that level for a significant number of years now. Um, but we have got capacity within our current arrangements to increase that to a payment of 46,000 per DFG. And there is an arrangement in exceptional circumstances that it come back to council for agreement if it exceeds that. So if you look at it, we're now seeing on average the cost. Um, I've just missed it there. Significant increase in cost per DFG. So most of the ones are now coming in in excess of 46,000 due to the increased payments, um, cost of materials and construction and everything else. So we are seeing consistently they're coming in above the 46. Section 5.8 gives you some indication of the type of need that leads to um, a DFG. And I think that's quite self-explanatory. Where we want to be, we want to be able to respond to requests for cost assessments in a timely manner. Uh, we want to be able to continue to support people to remain in the community in line with their well-being objectives. And we want to ensure that we use the available resources to maximum effect. The areas we need to look at next are going to be, we need to review the process for the funding agreement for DFGs, taking into account that we're now seeing a significant um, increase in cost per DFG. Um, and financially, we're not going to be able to um, support that over a longer period of time. Uh, we're looking at exploring alternatives. There is, you know, sort of some element in the new um regional strategic capital funds that can be put towards um, DFG and that gap between 36 and, you know, whatever it costs. And we working with the regional team to look at that. And we will continue to improve the waiting list member numbers in response times for the cost assessments. And we will continue to monitor the DFGs and the associated impact um, of the backlog of cases through the pandemic. So. Any questions? Thanks. Thank you, Angela. Um, so before we open up for questions, I just want to remind everybody of the scrutiny focus for this item. So scrutiny tried value by addressing the issues and the barriers on long wait times and establish a forward plan to ensure that the grant funding is fully utilised and spent annually. Um, so opening up for questions. First, I have Councillor Ian Thomas. Thank you. Uh, Angela, item 3.9. Uh, you say that all three DFG staff were made redundant and the grant is now administered under a service level agreement with RCT. Um, how is this working out? Has it led to improvements or problems? Would you be OK if I pull Suzanne Lewis Abbott because she has day to day um, management responsibility there to provide um, better response than I would? Thanks, Sue. Okay. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, so um, since we um, enacted the service level agreement with RCT in February 2020, at which point we had no staff and probably a backlog of about 100 um, DFGs that needed to be processed, um, we've been more than satisfied with the support that we've received. RCT have a larger grants team and a number of officers who not only process the means tests or the administration a lot quicker, but they in turn have an SLA with Comtaf Care and Repair to carry out the technical works on their behalf. 
Um, so it's it, it's sort of a dual arrangement, but our SLA is purely with RCT, and then there's a subsequent SLA between RCT Council and Care and Repair. And in terms of um, the the times for um, responses for referrals from from the COTS, the DFG, and then into people's homes, um, the feedback is a lot more positive. People are kept informed. There's there's more staff and resilience, I suppose, from both an RCT and care and, care and repair perspective dealing with DFGs than we, we could have done even with the with grants team we had previously. So in terms of operational delivery um, and projected spends going forward, uh, we're more than satisfied. I think it, it's pertinent to note, and I'm sorry I, I wasn't able to provide a lot of this data in the pulling together of this report because only now we're getting quarter two data but the projections are we are set to overspend and not only have we spent the potentially the 850,000 uh, £850,000 allocation for this year but we've also spent the 624,000 pound underspend from last year so you can see a massive increase in the demand but also the throughput of the works i suppose the challenge is now because cots are at a full complement of staff um you know how do we resource this going forward if the demand is going to continue thank you Suzanne. I've got one more question, Chair, if that's all right. Um, in relation to 310, um, we we're talking about the um, 624,000 underspend on DFGs and that they were carried forward to 22-23. And some of it will be used by um, Merthyr Valley Homes to future-proof some of their housing stock that is allocated to older people. So it looks as if that's not relating to any grant applications. I just wondered if you could explain how that is working. Yes, yeah, so um, what we did in the last financial year was take a proposal to council um, looking at the trends of those um, who most require DFGs and what more was coming through. And the majority of them was conversion to wet rooms rather than the standard baths. Um, having anti-slip flooring, things like that. Um, so when we were in the position that we had this £624,000 underspend, rather than give that money back, what we wanted to do was have a look at some of the existing stock within Merthyr Valley Homes who, who, who currently fall within the DFG portfolio as well, to have a look if there's any future proofing we could do with some of the 50 plus stock. And many of those had the old baths and things in. So there were a number of um, adjustments made to existing properties to future proof for the longer term. But what we saw is because the demand for DFGs increased, we actually did far less of that than we thought. And we, we diverted the attention to the DFGs that were coming through. So the majority of that £624,000 spend has been on DFGs solely. And there's been a minor amount, I think it's around 100000 but again, I will have all of the data in the next month or so that I'm happy to share with scrutiny um, on the the current spend up to quarter two and projected spend. So the majority of which has been spent on DFGs, but purely Merthyr Valley Homes have been delivering the Merthyr Valley Homes DFGs and all other DFGs have gone through the RCT and care and repair system. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Gareth Richards, you were on the screen, but you disappeared. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I was cutting the yellow out there. Might be being on. Could I wish on up the screen? But um, getting used to the system, it is. Uh, first of all, thanks to Suzanne for um, suggesting she be bringing the figures because that was, that was going to be one of my questions. Um, so up to date figures would be appreciated, Suzanne. Um, my questions are around uh, paragraphs uh, three, five, and three, four, and three, five. The incredible increase, really, in the um, the number of referrals that are being made. And I'm wondering if anyone can. I, obviously, there's an outline given in paragraph um, three, five. Um, but is this a trend which is happening across Wales or specific to um, to Merthyr? Um, and obviously. The, whilst there's an ageing population, I believe within the county borough, it, it wouldn't have increased that much in this over this period, and that's of course the reasons why they're not being admitted, perhaps to care homes or whatever. Thanks, Councillor Richards. 
we've been scratching our heads ourselves because there are a couple of things that this could be a reason why we've seen a significant increase at this point. What we did see during the pandemic was a reduction in the number of people who were coming forward and asking for assessments because they didn't want someone to come into the, into their home to keep themselves safe, you know, appreciating that some of the cots would have gone to several places before going in there. So we did see a, a decrease. We also know that we've got a demographic increase in the number of older people with more complex care needs living in the community. What we're not sure of for this year, is this everything just squeezing together? So is this a real lag from the last two years, plus an element of complexity? Or is this going to be a long term impact? So Suzanne and I were discussing it as part of the preparation for this. And we're not really sure at this point. So I think what we're saying is we're going to monitor the position over the next year. So at least then we get into more of a stable position. Is this increase um, significant? RCT have seen an increase similarly, and I know our colleagues in Bridgend are also seeing it. And there's a number of um, local authorities are looking to use that regional capital fund to meet that gap with the DFGs. So, you know, we've seen pretty much the same across um, Wales. But again, is this a, a peak and is going to sustain at that level? Or is this, you know, sort of pushing forward some of the stuff that would have been done in sort of 2021, 20, 20, 22, 21, 22? Plus, we may have had some backlog as well because we had, you know, sort of um, we didn't have as many cots there. So I think it's all sort of coming together in 22-23. So we'll monitor. Thanks, Councillor Richard. Another question with regards to that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Andrew, you, you mentioned um, the backlog from 18-19. But obviously that was pre-pandemic. Would that be accountable due to the lack of cots at that time? I think, again, in that period, what we saw was a reduction in the number of the, the OTs. Um, and there was also an issue with the grants team as well, whereas, you know, the few of them were off on long-term sick and then is eventually finished. So I think that was a period where there was an issue both with COTS and the grants team that we've sort of worked to um, rectify that issue. Yeah. Chair, I leave other members. I, there are two more questions I'd ask, but perhaps give other members a chance at this point. OK, yeah, thank you, Gareth. Um, yeah, so there's uh, me, Claire, then Clive, and then if you want to come, come in then, if that's all right, Gareth. Um, I think my question is for Susan, really, is in relation to uh, knowing you've said the, inf the the figures in relation to Merthyr Valley Homes, because um, we've got a joint workshop on the 29th of November. Will it be, re can we have them for then? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we're just collating quarter two's data now. So in the next two to three weeks, we can present all of the spend to date and projections up until Q3. But currently, um, just looking at the data cold, all of the funding on all sides will be spent before the end of quarter three. So that's the challenge then going forward. And as the new referrals come through, where, where do we go? Thank you. Um, I've got another question in relation to um, permissions from housing providers and looking at barriers you know you know are are there any barriers i'm just thinking like um from private landlords and things with permissions for, for installations in properties and then like what's the pathway then you know is that a hold up as well and how is that managed We don't uh, we don't tend to get involved at the front end. So Andrew, I don't know whether you've got any feedback from a from an OT perspective, but from a grants perspective, as soon as somebody somebody's gone out and, and we've um sort of assessed the majority of ones that come through are owner occupiers or will be our stock transfer organization, Merthyr Valley Homes. Um private renters are eligible and we aren't aware of any issues or barriers that have prevented anybody who's been recommended through. I haven't got the figures in front of me, but so I'm only providing some anecdotal information. 
from my recollection that I think it was you can count on one hand the okay. number of private rentals where um, you know, the landlord has not agreed to um, undertake some of the adaptations. But that is mainly due to the fact that if that person moved on, mm. then they've got to pay to reinstate that property and to you know, sort of let it to someone else. So I think they're OK with some of the minor things like wet rooms, mm. you know, but then if it was a major adaptation, they've got to think of, you know, that property has got to be re, you know, re-left at some point. And if it's going to incur costs mm. to them to put the property back into its previous condition, then I don't think they're that keen mm. on, on doing that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, we've got Councillor Claire Jones. Um, I did have questions, but everything that I wanted to ask, other people have asked instead. So instead, I'd just like to say thank you for constructing the report. It's much appreciated. And thank you, everyone else, for asking my questions. So sorry. Councillor Clive Tevi. Yes, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in the hospital and one of the consultants happened to say to me that one of her patients had just been told that she had to wait 56 weeks for an assessment and I just wondered over the next year do you, what waiting time do you expect it to drop to you know 56 weeks seems a long time and I should say she didn't know that I was on the scrutiny committee she just happened to say it randomly in all honesty was she just for me to check was that person <laughs> because it was PCH was it someone who was living in Merthyr or was there someone else ah. living in RCT or Blind Gwent or Powys that's a good point I haven't thought of that I'll, yeah I'll find, if you look find at it them. currently yeah. our sort of um long uh, our current waiting times I know we're near that, if you look at but, it. But, I but think... they couldn't understand, and that explains yeah. it, really. It's probably not... I think the longest waiting times we've got at the moment is an average eight to ten weeks. Yeah. For an That's assessment. That's a good point. I, I'll look into yeah. that, come to think of it, and I'll come back but then to you. If you look at it, I think what we tend to find, and Sue's will bear this out as well, is that quite often... There's the OT assessment that can, you know, they can start that assessment, but then sometimes we have to get medical information on top of that to support the application. Then they need to go through, you know, are they mixing up the time of assessment to the time the assessment's completed and going through the full DFG process and getting the build completed? Uh, yeah. Because bear in mind, if you're looking at an extension, then we've got to go through planning, we've got to check the property. And although we haven't in included in the report, quite often what we see is that, you know, if you look at the housing stock within Mertha, it's old terrace properties that don't, you know, sort of readily lend themselves to being adapted for a modern way of life that takes into account people's, you know, sort of physical disabilities. And, you know, the, the, quite often the OT will go there and say, you know, well, they need a wet room or this is the type of adaptation. We were closely with the grants team then to go and look at that property to see what the feasibility is that we can undertake it. So, you know, someone needed the only way they could have a downstairs um, wet room was to extend out to the property. Well, if they've got a small enclosed backyard that is right next to someone else's property, then you can't build that extension no matter what, you know, without you know the funding doesn't even come into it then the property cannot be adapted so some of the things we look at then is you know through the grants team we will try and support people to move and support them through grants to move to an alternative property that would better suit their needs and you know where that i can think of a few occasions where you know we've supported people and the ot's will go with them then to look at the new property to see if that can be adapted rather than say, well, you know, we can't adapt this property. You're going to need to look for another one. And then they'll say, all oh, right, you know, we're going to look at this rather than some approach or something, then come to us later and say, you know, can you adapt this? And we're going to know you're in the same boat as you were earlier on. I, I suspect this case must, because we get people from Powys, Blyna Gwent, yeah. all the way 
fairly everywhere now. Uh, the other question I was going to ask, which you sort of answered really, I think, is that I had a wet room put in my house, preparing for when I'm older. Yeah. And, you know, they cost about £7,000. So these costs of over £40,000 are often for knocking walls down or building extensions. Or something. In, in all honesty, as I said, a lot of the properties don't lend themselves to no. be able to adapt an existing room within that, the house. So then what it may be is, and if you look at the examples that we've put in, I can't remember which number it is, in section 5.8, You'll see mainly the DFGs are around supporting someone with a wet room um, and living on single level, you no know, sort of living. So it would be the wet room on occasions is also a bedroom, they say. So you can't uh, reconfigure the inside of the property. So it is looking an extension to being able to be able to fit a wet room and a sleeping area out, you know, on, to, on the end of the property. Oh, th thanks very much. Yeah, yeah thanks. thanks. Thank you, Councillor Tubby. Um, we've got two hands up. Um, can I go to Suzanne Lewis Albert first, please? Because I believe you need to leave. Is that right? Yeah, um, I'm really sorry, Chair. I, I've got an, another appointment now, but I'm more than happy if there are any other um, further DFG questions. Um, information you require in readiness for the joint scrutiny on the 29th. Mm. Please um, let, let Chair or Angela know and, and we'll collate them and we'll make sure that we'll present those during that scrutiny meeting. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Thank you all. Councillor Declan Salmon. And then we'll go back to Gareth Richards. Thank you, Chair. Um, just uh, just for clarification in, in relation to Clive's question, Angela, if someone from Merthyr Table is in. Councillor Salmon, you've muted yourself. Sorry about that. Did you hear anything of what I said? No. No. Right. OK, I don't know who muted me then. Um, OK, it's uh, looking for clarification in regards to uh, in relation to Clive's question. Uh, Angela, if someone from Mr. Tidville is in Prince Charles Hospital and they go through a serious operation or a procedure, is it yourselves or the hospital that does the assessment, the cost assessment? Right, there is clear guidance on the responsibility um, when someone's in hospital and it goes and it's still partially aligned to what used to be the old chronically sick and disabled um, criteria where the community OTs would, it's the hospital's responsibility to undertake the assessment for that safe discharge. So if someone's in hospital and they need to go home, it's the hospital-based OT that is responsible for undertaking the assessment for safe discharge. In terms of longer term need, that is the responsibility of the community OTs. If it is a DFG, though, it is slightly a bit more convoluted. Yeah. So for a DFG, it's likely that that person has got a long term need. So you wouldn't do, you know, if I went and broke my leg today and I couldn't get up and down stairs, then we wouldn't get a D I wouldn't be um, eligible for a DFG for a downstairs bathroom. Yeah, I'm putting it pretty simply now. But then what we do see quite often, you see someone who's been, you know, a significant um, injury, certainly acquired brain injury, road traffic accidents, where people then have prolonged periods of time where they move from the acute unit down to Rookwood, in which case we would do a joint assessment to look at would the property need to be adapted because the hospital based OTs, that's not their area of expertise. So we would, you know, sort of do a joint assessment then to support someone to come home. Does that make sense, Councillor uh, Yeah, Yeah, it does. Thank you, Angela. Um, I've got one more question and, and, and Chair, I apologise for this because it's a coming away from the, the recommendation um, that, that we were asked to look at in the report. So my question, I don't I don't need the answer today, to be honest, because obviously Angela won't have the answer. Um, but I'm just wondering if um, 
obviously we've been given the um, the waiting list for an assessment to be done. Um, I'm wondering at some stage where I, I know you're really busy. Would it be possible um, to give us information on how long is a waiting list uh, for work to be done following an assessment? You know, if you can give some some sort of indication on that in future. That's probably not as easy to no. um, put an average time on because it could be quite straightforward. If you look at it, um, stay lifts a, a, a disabled facility grant. So if the assessment was done, it was straightforward. There weren't yeah. any windy bends on on stays. That could be sort of put in place quite quickly. The smaller adaptations are usually turned around quite quickly. Um, as it stands now, it's difficult to give you an accurate timing because when if you've got the backlog from, you know, sort of the position um, post-COVID, so there were some DFGs that were already in the system that have been needed to be picked up. And the fact that, you know, contractors are far more difficult to um, provide. I think in order to get a realistic picture, you're probably better off if you wouldn't mind if we could bring it back to scrutiny next year when things have settled down a bit. And then that would give you a real in a real term um position rather than one that's really clouded, you know, because of, you know, the post pandemic um position. Is that okay? Yeah. Angela, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And thank you, Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Salmon. Gareth Richards, please. Um, I was going to ask this, but to lead off from what Declan has just asked, really, uh, Angela, obviously there are there are outside factors as well, really, such as the planning permission, there could be objections, etc. So that can increase the time then to resolve the issue. Am I correct with, with that? Is, you know, because this is a disabled facility grant, doesn't mean that we can circumvent our no. planning laws. And we have to work within that. And I can think of one example where someone wants us to go on to someone else's property mm. to actually build the extension and trying to say to people, well, you can't do that. Um, you know, and we will offer, particularly when we start and look at RSLs, some of the adaptations are like quite expensive adaptations to property. So if you think of it, if it's for an older person or even sometimes a child, unfortunately, you know, that child may not be living there or that adult may not be living there long term. Yeah. So, you know, they are responsible then, both of Alice Holmes have to put that property back into um, a condition for it to be relet as a general purpose. So that's why, like as Suzanne mentioned earlier, we we were looking at some of those properties, um, you know, to future proof. They were properties that are like the bungalows, horrid close, you know, some of those properties. If they could future proof those, we were thinking, well, what that would do is offset any future DFG requests for those properties because it is the local authority responsibility for DFGs only for Merthyr of Valley's homes, whereas all the other RSLs go through the physical adaptations grants that they draw down directly from Welsh Government. Yeah. That's one question down now, because I was going to ask you that question about uh, okay. other social land landlords, but you've answered that, so thanks, Andrew, for that. Perhaps if this would be a question for the, um, the John com Committee we've got coming up. But it's to perhaps briefly explain or outline that the procedures when it moves from MTCBC to RCT assessment. Oh, I I can give you a brief outline yeah. now. Yeah. The arrangement is right. The referral comes in if you're looking for the process. The referral comes in through adult duty that indicates that someone wants an OT assessment. At that point, we're not always 100% sure whether that is going to require an adaptation. So until they do the assessment, but then some of the other indicators may suggest that they are. So if someone says, oh, I just need some support with bathing, but I've got a medical condition that means I have mm -hmm. to be bathed on a daily basis, that would give it a lower priority than someone who's saying, I've got an extreme form of skin problem that means that I have to be bathed in a sort of emollient on once a week. 
yeah so that would update so they triage everything that comes in so yeah. every you know, couple of times a week they look at all the referrals come through and then they set them as you know within the criteria that we set in in there they do the assessment from the assessment then they may see that there's something that's really low level like the provision of a handrail yeah. what we do then we will go directly to cane repair for them to do, to facilitate having that piece of work done so that's straightforward so we wouldn't even go through the grants team yeah. you know this is something that we go directly to care and repay for yeah. um if it is then that they require you know sort of a bigger dfg that requires input from the grants team then they can electronically send the referral over to the grants team and usually mm -hmm. sometimes they will look at it and say can we have a pre-meet to have a look at the property to see what is feasible or not before it progresses to the full grant application. Once it's with them, they then facilitate looking at, you know, um, getting the planning permission done, sourcing a contractor, though there is always someone's right to choose a contractor of their own choosing, but it still has to sit within that um, financial envelope. Mm -hmm. And that's basically it. And then the they suspended as part of the cot assessment, but the cot go back in to make sure that everything's okay. Yeah. But do you want something more detailed? No, like that, that, that's or is that okay? yeah, I thought that was the case, but I wasn't sure, really, you know. Okay, thanks. And just one final one, very quick. Those um, service users who had made payment for towards the DFG, but were then retrospectively told they didn't have to make that payment. I understand payments are being made by some people. When the, when it, the rules yeah, change. Yeah, we, we had to look at this because we weren't sure how much, because we've heard, heard anecdotally that there were some people. So hmm. I'll use Mr. Tuffy there as an example. Is that he's been proactive and said, look, I know that it's going to be a good idea. I'm going to do this. Right, mm -hmm. and then goes and adapts the property. If people were in, and I don't get me wrong, right, I can't remember the exact measure in terms of you know how much you could afford to do. But before the DFG, what they will do, and they still do in part of the the large adaptations, is still subject to means testing. So then, what they would do is they estimate the price of the adaptation then they would go and ask for a financial assessment to say were you able to i pay a pay for it yourself and what they tend to do some people have chosen not to disclose their financial yeah. position so they've been liable to meet the full cost yeah. um and the enable grant only removed the um, requirement to undertake the financial assessment for the medium grants, but the big grants, they still sub DFGs, they're still subject to financial assessment. Yeah, sorry, perhaps I didn't explain myself. I understood that some people had already made a financial contribution <coughs> for the small or medium. Oh, right. Oh, and they there's... were then to be reimbursed what they had paid because it was retrospective. I can't say in all honesty that I know if anyone has been reimbursed because ultimately the grants funding sits with Suzanne. But yeah. I can ask if, yeah. if you want. So I think it was. It, it changed in 2021, April, I think, isn't it? Oh, they, they retrospectively changed it from April 21, but it only came in in November 21. So some people had paid, my understanding was. It's just to I check can, that all I those can, who had paid have been reimbursed, really. I can check that with yeah. Suzanne. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, I got the wrong angle yeah. sick there. Thank you, Angela. Are you OK with that, Gary? Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Clive, you were on my screen, but you've disappeared again. You're OK now, are you? Um, so lastly, the last question then is, let me just check, no hands on the screen, uh, is from Claire. I do apologise, Chair. I wasn't going to ask this question, but when you brought up occupational therapy and community occupational therapy, um, I then thought it was important for me to bring it in. Um, so you've got somebody in hospital who is um, still in hospital and they need the ad adaptations done. Um, are they going to be high priority? Because obviously while the patient is in hospital, mm -hmm. they are bed blocking. Um, and I just wondered how is that looking at the moment? Because I am aware of somebody in hospital waiting 
with the community occupational therapy and occupational therapy to have adaptations done they are minor but I'm just wondering because they are just in hospital now awaiting for that so thank you I suppose it depends on the level of the adaptation um as I said earlier um one of the things in order to facilitate the safe discharge it is for the hospital OT to undertake that so if it's a minor adaptation such as a handrail um or a rail going up the stairs the hospital or OT can refer directly to care and repair right. and uh, the and um, because there's a couple of schemes is the RAP program which is the rapid adaptation program whereby hospital OT or even ourselves can make a referral directly to um can repair to to get that adaptation undertaken but those are only small adaptations yeah, yeah. they can't do the like, major dfg yeah get yeah, us up no thank you thank so, you so much I, I do apologize Jack. no it's okay it's but you know there is arrangements so they can go directly thanks no, it's absolutely fine. And I'm awful sorry, Angela. I have got one more. I'm really sorry. Um, it's just in relation to 7.2, exploring alternative sources of funding that can offset the yeah. increased. So it says here, um, provision to support this through the level of funding allocated to this element is still yet to be agreed. Obviously, yeah. you know, what's the... Is, any further info? When is, will we have that info yeah, on that? Yeah, the regional capital funding that is the integrated capital funding one of the things that you can do through the provision of that grant is to meet that shortfall so we wouldn't pay like the 36 but we still have the conversation is so say we can pay up to cap is 36 we can pay up to 46 but grant them the FGs are coming in over 46 as it stands at the moment, in principle, we've got a regional agreement that we will use some of that funding to to meet that. What we haven't finalised is, will we look to do it for the difference between 36 up to the cost or the 46 up to the actual cost? But it hasn't been confirmed yet, so we still work. That has got to be agreement for... Um, three local authorities and from Tatum Ganug. So it'll, it's regional agreement rather than just a move someone. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you, Angela. OK, um, so opening up for comments. No, no comments. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> um, so we can rec so we can recommend a scrutiny can recommend that the content of this report has been discussed and noted. Uh, with consideration um, to risks around funding and the implications and also it's noted that the feedback from today um, will be taken to the social services corporate support and resources and regeneration joint workshop on the 29th of November to consider this report further and the end of spending the DFG and obviously we'll bring forward some of the feedback we've had today so thanks for that Angela. Okay, um, item number four is update on hospital pressures. Angela this is you again. I know, uh, so yeah, if you can just um, uh, introduce us and take us quickly through the report, that'd be great. Thank you. OK, thanks. Um, previously, Scrutiny asked us to provide an update on the pressures that we see in from the hospital, the impact it has on social care. So we've put together some information in here. It did ask that we provide some data. Because it's an ever-changing picture, as Councillor Tavi will be fully aware, I've got the current figures here, so you had an accurate picture of where we are as of um, this week. Yeah, so that's why there's no specific data in relation to who's in hospital, how many people are waiting, because it changes on a daily basis. Okay, um, section one covers the introduction and saying that there's a clear in, in 3.2, you can see there's a clear interdependency with what happens in the hospital it happened and the impact on social care and the impact of what happens in social care on hospital admissions and discharges. So we can't get away from that position, you know, we are codependent on each other. Um, 
in 3.6, one of the things we want to draw your attention to is traditionally we've seen, you know, that winter period is a period of significant pressure within the health and social care system. As we know, the changes in temperatures can have sort of significant impa impact on people with, you know, sort of chronic obstructive airways diseases. So we normally see an increase in demand um, during the winter. However, what we are seeing now that you know that those pressures are not actually easing. Come to from Gano went into business continuity two weeks ago, which is the highest level of pressure that you will see. Um, they were on borderline um, week for last, where they made decision that they weren't going to call business continuity. Now the difference would be, and I know it's not in the report, but just for you to be aware is there's different levels of escalation and once the health board calls business continuity what it actually means then is they start diverting ambulances to other eds and other hospitals but one of the things you saw when they pulled and it's called business continuity a fortnight ago that our neighboring health boards were in similar positions is um so you know that's what I'm saying that's the only real benefit of calling business continuity is the fact that you can divert. Um but you know this has happened a couple of times in you know the last year. Whereas if you look in the pre-pandemic and a few years ago, I I think about once I can recall it actually being, you know, sort of getting to that level. Yeah. So and we not just see and if you think where that was in sort of September, it was earlier in August. We're not talking about this just occurring it during, you know, the winter. Okay. Um up until probably, you know, sort of earlier in the year, we were still working with our health board colleagues in terms of an escalation process through the gold, silver, bronze, gold, bronze, I can't remember the figure, bronze, silver, gold escalation process. Um, and, you know, that was only stepped down, you know, sort of earlier in the year. So we've been running at a high level for some time. If you look at it in section four, we did reopen Glanaravan within a couple of weeks jointly to sort of look at providing additional sort of non-oxygenated bed space. Obviously, once our step down place was closed, we um and they're looking at that for something else now. Um Prior to the pandemic, you know, our ability to place in care homes were generally good. And whilst we experienced some periods of reduced capacity overall, we were able to support people to return home quickly through the provision of domiciliary care packages where needed. So one of the other areas, you know, we were able just to support people and we had a really quick turnaround for people who needed packages of care to return home from hospital. Um, and we've seen, you know, sort of, well, there were occasional periods where we saw high levels of demand. What we generally saw was those were shortlisted and, you know, sort of, we went back to a pretty good position in terms of being able to provide packages of care. Where we are now, we've got a social care and health system where the workforce is absolutely exhausted. You know, they've had to deal with increased numbers of people. They've had to um, deal with managing staff shortages because staff have needed to self-isolate, you know, because they can't work. They still cannot work in social care if they've got, um, if they have COVID, if they test as COVID positive, which means that, you know, they need them to fill those gaps with staffing. Um, a number of staff within specifically the domiciliary care sector have left, you know, they're seeing that they can earn as much money in the retail sector or in the hospitality sector, but they're doing the shift. And when they go home at the end of the evening, nobody in the Mrs. Jones is unsafe in, in, in at home by themselves. And that's been, you know, we've liaised with um, domiciliary care providers and those seems to be more of the reasons for people leaving. We increased the payments for domiciliary care um, staff to the real living wage before it was implemented by um, we, uh, Welsh Government. So we've been paying the real living wage for uh, about four years. Um, but it is still not actually sort of addressing some of the issues. So it's saying that just 
increase in the payment isn't actually sort of the answer to looking at some of the social care crisis um, in terms of domestic care and recruiting. We can see in section 5.4 that what we are seeing now is the between the reduction of domestic care workforce, um, periods where care homes are closed, even though we are, you know, sort of touch wood, the incidence of closing care homes because of cold wave outbreaks is significantly reduced. But what we are seeing is a reduction in, because we don't just place within both Tidville, we place in um, outer county. And what we are seeing is the number of specifically new sin homes that are unable to staff the number of beds they've got, but it's essentially with qualified nursing staff, not support workers. So if you look at it, there's um, a care home in um, Cannon that has got a whole um, floor that they're unable to staff and fill because they cannot you know, get qualified staff to, to um to work within that sector and you know our health colleagues similarly are having difficulty in recruiting in there we've been doing a lot of work this is really complicated and i didn't know how we were going to put this in the welsh government if you look in section 510 it starts covering off around the six goals of unscheduled care which welsh government is you know directing that we work together to look at how we support the pressures within you know the care system and if you look at it in section 511 is a brief outline of what each of the goals actually mean yeah so goal one is the coordination of planning and support of populations at greater risk of needing urgent or emergency care. One of the things we know is that if you look at it, people in the community, as they start to become more and more frail, the number of times they um, visit the GP increases. So you know, there are some indicators that people are starting to require more and more support. So how can we sort of get in early and sort of um, sort of divert them from needing higher care support needs? Um, signposting people with urgent care needs the right place at the right time. Probably the easiest way to illustrate something around that is if you had a visual problem, right, the GP may not be the best person to um, address some of the issues, but an ophthalmic optician may be a better person to give you advice on how to deal with our specific um, sort of problem with eyes. So one of the things they're looking at is trying to make sure that people are going to the right place to get the support rather than everyone go into the GPs or turn up a day and e. So this isn't just about you know, sort of kicking people out, it's also around directing people to where they can get the most appropriate support for their specific needs. Yeah. Um, clinically safe alternatives to admission to hospital. Some of the things that we're looking at is, you know, we've got something already in place, which is called the stable at home, which has been around for a number of years now, where we've got therapy and social work staff cited in A&E at PCH and RGH. They will undertake an assessment and if that person is clinically fit to return home, what they can do is the staff that are based in the assessment in ED can arrange for a package of care to be put in within four hours. Yeah, so what that means is that someone can go home, package of care will be organised, but they are safe to go home. So the assessment is they are safe to go home, but they we know we need a follow up package. So that's one of the examples uh, for goal three. Rapid response in physical or mental health crisis, that is predominantly a health area and social care will have very little input into that other than, you know, for mental health crisis, if someone requires section under the Mental Health Act, we provide the uh, approved Mental Health Act practitioners to support that. Hospital, ho optimal hospital care and discharge practice from point of admission. So 
well, someone's in hospital now, they're looking at, you know, sort of how can we make that process slicker? How do we make sure that things are done at the right time? And that is where that um, goal five covers. And then goal six is looking at home first approach to reduce the risk of readmission. So how do we support people to return home safely and, you know, try and prevent them going back into hospital? Yeah. Um, that's a very short, brief outline of what it is. There's lots of work going on within this um, area at the moment as, as the six goals and lots of work streams. I think there's probably about um, 10 work streams that are working a piece around this. Some of the things, you know, that we can see I put in 514 is the development of an electronic referral form, which means that the hospital based staff will complete that and will be able to send this to us electronically. Um, they're looking at the development of a navigation hub and that will be um, a coordination within the within Comtaf Morganog, so those referrals are going to the right place based on the information that's filled in the electronic referral form. Um, there's a development of a one list app where we keep saying amongst each other it's about the one version of the truth. And the example I'll give you that is that quite often a social worker will say, well, you know, Mrs. Jones is in hospital, we're currently waiting for the nurse assessment. Right, so the social worker sitting back and waiting for the news and assessment to come to them so they can continue with the overall assessment. The hospital will be sitting there going, well, we're waiting for the social worker to come and do something, but we haven't heard from. And it's almost then it comes into this like impasse where no one's doing anything for Mrs Jones. So what we're trying to do is improve that communication so everyone knows where someone is within that position. Now they're looking at some really complicated systems which one of which is talking about electronic whiteboards on each of the wards where they will have up-to-date information the one list project is trying to share that with local authorities so we all know the position mrs jones is discharged so no one's sitting back and waiting for the other to to make contact to them um they're looking at an acute frailty model. Um, it's slightly different on the three sites, so they're trying to align it so that you know the three sites have got a similar approach. And that's where we are. There is a lot of work on that. I could probably fill about 10 pages on what's going on with the six goals program at the moment. Um, where do we want to be? We want to be in a position where health and social care work together to provide better outcomes for people. And we want to have systems in place across social care and health services that support discharges and prevent people remaining in hospital longer than is necessary. The next couple of things that, that you know, we're doing is the several in initiatives such as the We Care campaign, the Real Living Wage across registered social care staff uh, is implemented along with increased payments um, several times in the last two 18 months. We need to review the impact of the actions taken during the reset period, but you know that's another piece of work that is now morphed into some of the work with the six goals, and we need to work together around the six goals program. And there's um, a report going to the regional partnership board uh, last week, which is looking at you know sort of what can we do in a more integrated way. So previously, the regional governance was that you had an adult board, a children's board that went to a transformational leadership group and then report up to the regional partnership board. That transformation leadership group is now an integrated locality group. So they're looking at how can we work more closely together to improve outcomes for individuals. So there's quite a lot going on in, you know, sort of in this arena at the moment. Thanks. Thank you, Angela. So we'll open up for questions. Um, did you say before, so you had figures? Yeah. There, please. 
Right. So based on like the end of last week, so as you say, things change. So this is an ever changing position. We've got 22 people who are who are in hospital for Mercer who are waiting for care room. Now, that's not just sitting waiting for care room. So I'll break that down to illustrate where we are. Of those, two of them are waiting for a vacancy in a care home, a nursing care home. Um, two of them are waiting for the home manager to come and assess them. We've got four people who who are currently going through the court of protection process, which is where someone hasn't got the capacity to make that decision on to the onward care. Um, we've got one person that's waiting for a nursing assessment. We've got two people who were self-funders who were sourcing the um, care home of choice. We've got two people who were waiting for a best interest assessment um, to determine, you know, have they got the capacity. There's three people who are currently in the process of uh, and being a, a assessment being undertaken by the social worker. So they're not waiting for the social worker. They are currently being assessed by the social worker. There's one person waiting for um, a decision support tool meeting. That sounds very complicated. But it's essentially where they're looking at the, whether there's a primary health care need or a primary social care need. So that is a tool they go through to identify that. There's three of those, the discharge is planned, so they're waiting to move to the care home. And there's two people who've been identified as needing care home, but as yet they've not been referred to social care. Yeah, so you know, it is a process, so not everyone, you know, sometimes when we talk about the numbers, it sounds as if all those people are just sitting there waiting. But, you know, there's quite a few of them who are waiting for other pieces of work before they go. We've got 14 people as of today in hospital waiting for um, a new package of care. Um, we've moved quite a bit in the last like couple of weeks. We've um, taken on an additional framework provider, which is QK. Um, they've now got up to speed and recruited staff. So, you know, they are taking it. 14 is not where we'd want to be, but, you know, we are seeing some improvement. And there are four people who are waiting for a restart of package. So that is as of the end of last week. Some of those packages, those people have already um, moved to, no, um, the package has been sourced and they go in in the next couple of days. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. Thanks, Thanks. for that. Um, so I've got a question around the, the goals mm. and prevention of hospital admissions. Um, now, is that in there some way in relation to access to GPs? Because I think um, from from what I have I have seen, and obviously you've spoken to residents in the ward, trying to get to speak to a GP is very problematic. And then obviously conditions worsen, or you know they're not seen as an emergency by somebody. With, you know you have a receptionist assessing whether you're an emergency or not. So you know. Is prevention and access to that GP included in those goals? That, in all honesty, we've got one of the um, Owen Weeks, who's a GP, but he's you now when people have additional bits on it, and I can remember what the title is. But Owen's a GP and he's actively involved in this in primary care and involved in several of these, looking at you know, how best to utilise the GPs. And again, parties like GP, everyone goes to the GP because if you think about it, that's what we're conditioned to do is, you know, for a number of years, if you watch the TV, it says if you've got this problem, go to the, your GP. If you've got that problem, go to your GP. And I think one of the things, as we mentioned earlier, there are alternatives than go into the GP. You know, if you go to the pharmacist, they're able to provide advice on some of the stuff. But I think a lot of people are not as a fay with looking at alternatives. So part of that is looking at saying, you know, directing people to the right place that is going to enable them to keep the health support they need. So the GPs are involved. Um, I think a lot of people are saying around and talking to GPs, they probably in that in 
support as well is that sometimes they need advice from some of the clinicians and that's not always available so then their only port call is to refer someone to get an ambulance and go into a and &E. so it it's a really complex system and it's all interdependent so they are looking at that as part of that six goals and one of the things they, we were talking about is the potential for you know uh, an integrated hub which would you know people would be able to contact that hub from outside and other professionals to provide that steer to where the more appropriate place is so if you look in some ways some of that is being met through um 111 but then i think people then if they don't if they wait they'll just turn up at a and &E anyway and i'm sure where councillor tavi will attest to the number of people who just turn up at a and &E. um what we do about that and i think one of the things that you know everyone accepts is it, no matter what we put in place we're gonna have to like work with our communities to look at that cultural shift as well mm -hmm. is you know people going to the right place rather than sort of you know because everyone will just think it's either gp or a and e um but you know again they're not always the best places to go so we receive better care from elsewhere thank you angela my other question is around the the discharge to recover then assess model so looking at that like through a MRSA lens is that something that's like integrated then in like the stay well at home is that something that just embeds then like different ways of working sorry if I'm a bit no 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 you know I can't see right if I it's, it's usually quite good to give an example of where we used to be and where we are now okay. that will show how the discharge to assess model is already working so in some ways we've gone down there oh i'm not saying how long ago it was a while ago that if someone was in hospital and it was identified they needed a package of okay, care the process was that the hospital-based staff would fill in a form that form would come to social care then it'd be very limited information on there and then we'd arrange for a social worker to go and do an assessment in the hospital where isn't you know where it isn't the best place to do an assessment then they'd fill it out they'd fill all the paperwork out and it was like you know 20 page assessment and maybe i'm dramatic there but you know it was an extensive assessment um they would then send that referral to a provider that provider would go in and provide a package of care they'd review it invariably people were saying yeah that's fine um and they would carry on so even when people improved, that package of care stayed there. But it was a very bureaucratic process going back and forth. A number of years ago, we made the decision to look at taking referrals directly from hospital. So it was bypassing the social worker going into hospital. And we strengthened our front door, domiciliary care. So it was an initial response service. So what we did, we upskilled those staff who could do the assessment in the house. Uh, when they were provided in the package of okay? case so they could actually see in real life what you know sort of a person was able to do we also enabled them to be able to assess for lower level pieces of equipment such as perching stools sliding um sheets you know sort of commodes so whilst they're there they're doing low level assessments for equipment but they're also assessing what that individual needs based on that information that was provided by the hospital staff so previously, if it wasn't for the pressures we are now, hospital would do that referral, we put the package in within a couple of days, that person would come home and we would do the assessment in that property and then make a determination. Some people went on to longer term packages, other people stopped where it was. So that's an example of where we were, we're already operating a discharge to assess model and we've been doing that for a number of years. So that works you know, really well. In some way, Stable at Home also does that. So they've done a, a, a quick assessment um, whilst people are in A&E. And then when they go home, again, the initial response picks up and does further assessment to see, is it just because someone's unwell? And, you know, as they naturally feel better, then there's no need for that package any longer. And again, you know, so when people are in hospital, they don't get up and walk around, you know, they lie in bed and some of the things that they would do at home, they're not doing, which generally means that they're quite weak 
going back home. And I think years ago, I think the description would be is like convalescence, you know, when someone go back in the house. So it, what we need to work out is, you know, I think the real key difference now is looking at a more multidisciplinary um, assessment as part of that. So if we want people to go home sooner, they're going to have far, they're going to have more complex needs. So in which case it's not for social care just to pick up everything because we can't and we can't do all that assessment. So, you know, I think one of the key um, elements is enhancing our community capacity across health and social care to make sure that we're able to undertake those assessments in the community. Thanks. Thank you, Angela. One more for me and then um, I've got Garth Richards next. Um, it's in relation, so you've mentioned QK. So my question is around staff, because I know you mentioned like recruitment is an issue. Like, have you got assurances like from the like, QK that, you know, the, the staff have regular training, they have regular supervision, that they look at, do you know what I mean? Have you got those assurances that those workers are looked after as well? Right. One of the things, if you look at it, is all care services, domiciliary care services, are subject to RISCA, um, which is the registration inspection of um, the registered yeah. services. Yeah. yeah. So as part of that, they've got to, you know, as part of the registration, they've got to demonstrate they supervise the staff that, you know, they're providing support and, you know, sort of um, ensuring they undertake training. We also we also have a contract monitoring officer that works closely with the providers and we've been doing it virtually for a while, but recently they started going back to the offices. They'll check the paperwork to say that people have had the, um, um, the, the appropriate training, supervision. So that is part of our contract monitoring with people. Thank you, Angela. Councillor Gareth Richards. Well, I'm going to uh, answer, the, pray answer the question, but I just comment that I'm pleased to see, Angela, that there's going to be a better joined up working possibly between the hospitals and um, social services. I, I, in all honesty, Gareth, I don't think we have any option. I think the current position is, and have you a few times as people saying the system is broken mm. um you know we've got pressures it's not going to happen yeah. next year when we start looking at you know the financial position is going to affect us as well <clears throat> but you know can we work more effectively together yeah. to try and do something rather than just use well it's social care's fault and you see it yeah. on the news and is where people say, well, you know, all these ambulances are out the front because social care aren't taking people at yeah. the back end. Yeah. But they're missing some things in there. Is one, the reduction in the bed stock across the health board has been significant over a few years. We're also seeing people with more complex needs. And, you know, talking to health colleagues at times, you know, when they've had significant not talking recently, but, you know, where they would walk the wards and look at who can we get out. But the acuity of some of the people on the wards is, you know, people are really ill. Mm. Is You know, they may not need acute medical intervention, yeah. but they're ill. Yeah. And, you know, the, the need to... One of the things they're starting to look at is... is right. <laughs> I'm looking at Clive there. But one of the things that they're really pushing at the moment is is trying to subdivide the people who are ready to go home before they clamp everyone together into, you know, the um, either medically fit for discharge or not medically yeah. fit for discharge, which was the simple term. But then I think they're starting to recognise it's not as simple as that, is that some people are clinically optimised, right? So the likes of Councillor Tavi, but they isn't going to be actively doing something like changing the medication or, you know, sort of doing tests to find out what's wrong with them. So that would be, they've done all that. This person is, you know, clinically optimised. There's no further intervention from a medic. Um, but this person is still really well, right? So then one of the things they're looking at as well, oh, we'll need a, a more input from physio or T. So they're looking at and subdividing it into functionally optimised. So that means, you know, you've had your treatment, you know, we've done this. So if I use a simple analogy of broken leg, right? So someone's got a broken leg, 
or you know sort of fractures the hip they go into hospital the orthopedic surgeon takes them down to surgery they fix the broken hip and then they're back on the ward they then need to recover from the anaesthetic but then you know clinically then they say right that's knitted we don't need to put any more interventions in there but that person now needs some physio to get them to where they need to be to get back home yeah so that's the difference in a very simple term between clinically optimized and functionally optimized so they may need some um further interventions but we've also got some people then who are like really ill there's some people in the health board who were on you know sort of um on respirators ventilators whichever way you want to call them you know that are they, that they can't move on from there because there are no news norms that can take people who are on ventilators. Um, so, you know, these things that news norms are doing now, they're far more than they used to do. Mm. You know, read for a couple of years ago is like, you know, news norms are basically people with a bit of news in care and needs and GP call ring once a week. Um, and, you know, didn't have that level of need. But if you go into the news norms now and some of the things they're managing, yeah. you know, is like, you know, much different. Same as social care. I think we, we talked 15, 20 years ago, Dom's every case, social care staff used to go in and they do a bit of shopping, a bit of file like then, oh, how are you? Shall we do your day and have a little chat? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you won't get any you won't see any of that in social care now yeah. most of the packages are coming out the four calls a day you know people who, who can't get out of bed you know um and rely on those social care staff double handed staff to move them you know, with the requests re in the last week is you know someone can't reposition themselves so they need you know sort of repositioning every two hours and we say we can't meet that level of support in, in the community from social care from to yeah. um you know it's changing, you know, sort of considerably uh, what people are yeah. driving. But what I was um referring to specifically, uh, Andrew, was that the, the discharge point, there's often confusion really. Family come to us saying mother wants to come home. Mm. Hospital is saying then social services are not engaging, but it's pleased to hear you saying that there's going to be more joint working in that process. That's right. And that's the bit where we're saying, like, we're all trying to get that one version of the truth. Yes. Which yeah. is, you know, so where are we in terms yeah. of, you know, the progress and yeah. for, you know, Sir Angela or Gareth to come home from hospital? Yeah. What needs to be done to move them on to the next stage? Yeah. And it's often don't the misinformation really more than anything. Yeah. You know, the 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 the, the um oh, the relatives between, having misinformation. But it's sometimes it's between everyone, you know, yes. I'm yeah. being quite honest. Just a follow up with regards to um staff shortages, uh, Angela. Have we any shortages in our own to well, our our homes, the, the council homes? I, d I think we got some vacancies. Yeah. Um, in terms of the loan disability home, because we reduced respite, um, because we got two respite beds. Um, what we did was we didn't fill some posts where people had left through retirement mm. until we knew the respite service was back up and running. Because uh. you know it was pointless having staff there if we were not able to provide respite. The care homes. What we tend to find is. Because you've got a number of staff on different contractual hours, is that someone's got and just simple, so don't take that these are the actual hours. So someone with a thirty-hour contract leaves, right? So someone who's on a twenty-one hour will say, "Well, I'd rather do thirty hours." Mm -hmm. So they apply for the thirty hours, right? To so move that up into that person moves into that post. That means you've got a twenty-one hour mm -hmm. post vacant. And then someone with 16 hours might say, well, I want to do the 21 yeah. hours and apply for that. And then use the 16 hours. So what we see sometimes is, you know, there is constant vacancies, but firstly, because there's like, you know, people have moved up. Yes. Yeah. So it looks as if it's far greater, but it's all set up for that original post going. Yes. Yeah. And then all the other vacancies look there. I think there's one post that they're struggling with down in 
um, debargered at the moment, which is a 16 hour domestic. I think they've advertised the, this is the second advert um, and they're struggling to get mm. the lab post. Well, look, is debargered uh, officer in charge in post now? Um, we advertised uh, the post. We did offer some of the post. Um, unfortunately, the personal circumstances changed, which meant that they weren't in the position to take it. So we've re-advertised, and I think we've got interview set. Um, I want to say next week. Yeah. Yes, and then but then most people are applying. It depends on what post they're currently in. Then you know, quite a lot of the posts are like three months um, notice. Yeah. So, which means no one will put the notice in, understandably, until they've got everything no, dotted right, and yeah. crossed. Um, so, you know, you can see there's quite a delay in filling some of these yeah. posts. But we are looking, and I know this is separate to this, but, you know, we're looking at what we can do to provide some more resilience within our care home management. Um, and we're currently doing a piece of work around that um, mm -hmm. as it stands. Thanks, Sandra. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, no. I'm oh, sorry, Ian Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, Angela, um, um, item six, what we need to do next regarding um, uh, the employees along um, registered social care, you were suggesting um, the implementation of the real living wage, which, as you said, progress is being made on. Do you agree that equally important is the conditions of people's contract? <laughs> um, for example, um, with like the domiciliary care as a NAT, paying for travel time between assignments, allowing enough time for visits, and possibly equivalent superannuation arrangements to other local government staff. And is there anything that could be done about any of that? Right, sorry, I didn't catch the last part, Councillor Thomas. What was it? Pardon? I didn't ca catch the last part of your question then. The last part? Well, um, I've I, got the travel time. Yeah, and time, enough time for per visit. Yeah, and I got access that. access to equivalent superannuation arrangements. Right, that's a bit I didn't quite catch. Sorry. All right, sorry. Um, in terms of travel time, we pay people for travel time and the cost of travel. So that's All incorporated right. into, that's part of the contract. That's been in place so long, can't even remember. Right, so that is an agreement that, okay, they may not be paid the full real living wage paid for the possible time, maybe a reduced time, but they are paid for the travel time and they are paid travel expenses. So that's already in place. So in terms of visit times, we have got arrangements to say in that, you know, if <coughs> the care needs of those individuals change, we will work, as I said earlier, we've got, you know, sort of contract monitoring officers. If there's ever an issue, the providers, you know, there was one came today saying the providers were finding it difficult to meet the support needs within an hour. So, you know, they asked, could they like increase it to an hour and a half, which is you know, a significant one. So, you know, they will come back and they will work with each other to look at, you know, the, the, the right time. I do agree sometimes, and in terms of the super run, that's beyond what I can make any decisions on because that is under green book arrangements um, in terms of you no know, staff. So if you look at it under our staff are all within you know, sort of, um, within the entitled to join the government, the most of Tidville County Borough Council uh, pension right. scheme, but I don't think that's open to, you know, sort of our commission services. Talking to, you know, sort of, in all honesty, our contract monitoring staff of, you know, daily contact with the commission providers. 
some of the things that you're saying, you know, if you look at it, and we'll give an example, is something that keeps coming up is that parity of esteem between, you know, sort of um, social care staff and nurses. So if I give you a simple example, if a district nurse is due to call to you, they don't give you a time they're going to call as, unless you're having injections because it's time specific for your diabetes. But they say you get a call on Thursday to change your dress in. People sit in the house all day. They may sort of grumble about it saying they're waiting, but they will never criticise the nurse for coming late. Right. Social care staff, if, you know, and I'm sure as members, you've had complaints where staff are not turning up on time. So this is some of the pressure that dormitory care staff are under. They will have a timed run, right? So they'll come to Angela first, you know, they'll come to Gareth next, then they come to Ian. And so they, like, have a voter who they need to call to. So if they go to me, right, to come to me, and I'm having a bad day today, right? I'm really feeling awful, right? I've had, um, I've been incontinent, I've had an accident, I need to change my bed, you know, and I'm really feeling rough. So they're in this like catch 22 question. Do they see to me to make sure I'm safe? And then I'm late coming to you. And then they're late coming to you because of, you know, sort of is an ongoing impact. Or do they make sure that they come to you because that's the time been allocated? And what is being fed back is a lot of people are saying that, you know, is that criticism? Like, you know, as soon as they go, you know, they've already been seen to someone who's like really ill. And we're saying that like, what people we support in the community are really complex. And then, you know, they they go late. And the first thing that comes in is that someone will say, well, you shouldn't be near at half past nine. And what time is this? And that constant sort of, you know, sort of pressure of being late, you know, but they're doing the right thing. They're not just dawdling and going, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I think I'll go to Tesco's now with a little chip of tea or something like that before I go on to the next one. And those are some of the pressures that people are really seeing is more the reason for people leaving um, rather than anything else. And let's be honest, you know, some people are really rude to some of the social care staff um, who are out there. And, you know, they feed back to us. And some of the stuff I wouldn't want to repeat there you know, is the way they have spoken to and is, you know, and they're saying, I've had enough. And I think another thing that changed quite a lot is when people pay for services and we got, we got extremes, right? We've got people who are ever so grateful for anything that's done, right? And then you've got other people is nothing's ever good enough. And, you know, they feel that they are contributing towards their care and so they're paying you, so you should be doing more with you, you know, um, they ask you to do. So that anecdotally is more of the feedback that's coming back from the social care staff of some of the reasons why they leave in our profession. And let's be honest, they've had to really say something else, a really sort of you know, pressure time all the way through COVID. They didn't sit back and, you know, were furloughed. They were out there, didn't know what the pressure was going to be, you know, what the impact was going to be to them. And now people across, you know, society are taking stock and saying, do I want this anymore? And that's contributing to some of the reasons why people leave and leave and work in there. Thank you, Angela. Yeah. Any other questions? Any? Oh, comments. Yeah. Councillor Tuffy, comments. I was say the problem is with all these queues, especially when they went into business continuity, they cancelled every elective operation in the hospital. So the waiting lists are going up and up and people that have got gallstones keep coming back with pain and they're just waiting months for operations. And the other problem then, of course, is that you often have 12 ambulances outside the hospital and sometimes people are in an ambulance for six hours with a broken leg or hip or something and they just waited in the ambulance and then people are waiting then on on the roads injured for disproportionate amount of times and i think what summed it up for me the problem my mother died recently she was 92 but she was dying of cancer and you know we thought she'd have died a while ago but 
she fell and broke a hip while she was living in a two bedroom flat supported accommodation and I said to the home she'll never come back now but she managed to live for another five months and for five months I should say this was outside Merthyr's not this bar the social worker was saying she'll be going back to the residential home and the residential home was saying we could never cope with her now because they were struggling before and two days before she died then they moved her to a nursing home and the, the five months she was in hospital they could have done 25 hip replacements and until they sort this issue out of working together unfortunately they'll never solve the problem really you know so that's all I was going to say thanks Thank you, Councillor Tubby. It sounds, Angela, this isn't a quick fix. This is years and years worth of work needed. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Declan Salmon. Thank you, Chair. Um, Angela, my apologies. Um, I wasn't quick enough in pressing the button um, to leave a comment uh, on the last agenda item. But I just want to say thank you for, for presenting both reports, but in partic particular agenda item number three regarding COTS. Um, and if you could pass on a thanks to all the team for, for all the hard work they're doing, because I know I sent a, a lot of referrals through yourself. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Councillor Salmon. Um, any other comments? Thank you, Angela. <sighs> OK, so just to close, so scrutiny can recommend scrutiny can recommend that we've noted the contents of the report. And obviously, I think feedback from this, we, I think we'll also take in really into the workshop, because like you said, it's the codependency, isn't it? It's all holistic. So um, so thank you for that, Angela. Um, so it's up to you. You can leave now if you want to. I'll go have a cup of tea. She, she thank you. Talk already, it's okay. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Angela. Okay. Um, right. Agenda item five: forward work program. Um, so this is on your list. It's, it's standard agenda item but obviously it's important to notice a live document and flexible and it can change based on um, the development of the cabinet forward work program or if there's any urgent issues um, for discussion that are raised um, so and it was agreed last meeting so we're all happy with the forward work program okay that's agenda item five agenda item six scrutiny referrals there's none um so if oh, there's no officers on the call now anyway, so it's just us. So yeah, so item uh, agenda item seven report recommendations. Um, and it's just really just for us to have a chat again in relation to um, item three and item four in relation to the COTS assessments and the update on hospital pressures. And just as a committee, do we feel like we've added value and that we've met the recommendations of those reports? Oh, I asked Richard? No, sorry about that. A question after this. Sorry. All oh, right, okay, that's it. Um, so yes, just are we happy that we've met the recommendations of the report? Yeah, and I think as well, obviously, because we've got um, the workshop um, and it's good, you know, we'll have some extra data as well with that on, um, on the 29th of November. Councillor Richard. You missed the last meeting. Okay, so, so do you want to explain a little bit around the um, yeah. the joint issue sorry okay so as part of the agenda we've agreed to have a joint workshop between uh, three scrutiny committees that have got an interest in this report so we're having a joint committee or joint workshop with the corporate services with social services and the regeneration committee and that will be held on the 29th of november and details are to follow and it's around the court report then is yes it? yeah Thanks for that, Jane. Um, OK, so going on to that, um, item eight, feedback on scrutiny activities. Um, so like Jane said, the 29th of November is to consider the cost report and the underspending of the DFGs. Um, there is a joint workshop with learning, but we need to clarify that as well um, for the 5th of December. But we'll, do we know when? 
we know that. There's another joint workshop with learning um, and that's going to be around uh, standards and the poverty agenda. Uh, it's on their scrutiny committee for the 5th of December and we're just working out when the workshop will be held. So we'll get a date to you as soon as we can. Thank you, Jane. And then um, we have got the court site visit arranged um, for members, which is next Thursday. Um, and that's 10 a.m. up in Keir Hardy. So I think that'd be really good for us to go and meet the, um, the team up there. And then obviously feedback from that, then we can bring to the workshop on the 29th of, of November. Did MDS want to give any feedback on or raise anything in relation to agenda item eight? No. OK. Agenda item nine, any other business? I have none. Um, so next scrutiny meeting is the 29th of November at 4 p.m. The workshop, I believe, is at 2 p.m. So beforehand. All right. Thank you. Thank you all.